Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Dolly Parton's World, Exploring Gender, Race, Class, and Sexuality in the South. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being patient with last week's uh, scheduled session. We had intended to work with Luke Bovins from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Philosophy Department, but we had major storms uh, in the Triangle area. We had a lot of power outages and internet loss. It just so happens that Luke was down the street and he was affected, so we had to reschedule that. Um, it's not very often that we have any kind of technical or weather difficulties, and it always feels a little odd when we don't have you know, a weekly session together, but, um, but I do appreciate your willingness to be inconvenienced uh, in that sense. I also want to welcome you back to tonight's session. Um, you know, as when I put through put together the the titles for each uh, each year, there are certain ones that kind of pop out at me, ones that I look forward to doing, and tonight's is certainly one of them. I look through the uh, roster of attendees tonight, and I'm always curious about what attracts each of you to sign up for a session like this, one titled so explicitly Dolly Parton's World. Um, you know, Kevin over in Winston Salem, an hour and a half uh, to my west, or maybe even a little farther down the down the road. Natalie and Charlotte. You know, I, I sort of I think understand that there's a southern lens we're looking at. Um, Melanie up in Baltimore. You know, maybe it's a little farther in the Mid Atlantic. And then we've got our very uh, frequent guests, uh, Ulysses from Los Angeles, and Robin and Cristobal. Um, really pleased that Marilyn can join us from NC State. Marilyn was in our graduate student program last summer. But all of you, I think, uh, will be introduced to a way of looking at and using not just music, but culture and social, historical, uh, geographic layers to better understand our connections with each other. And I'm excited to see in the chat box what each of you uh, do to make sense of this, uh, particularly if you don't live in the South or if you don't necessarily have uh, Dolly Parton LPs in your collection. Uh, before we get started, I do want to thank Libby Taylor and Mike Williams for their continued hard work on my staff. Uh, Libby is the Education Programs Coordinator, helps uh, design and work with our scholars and our guests for all of our webinars. Uh, Mike runs our online course catalog, and together uh, we do our best to make sure that the activities and the initiatives that we undertake are meaningful for the classroom. National Humanities Center is located in Durham, North Carolina, um, and we, uh, on an annual basis, welcome a fellowship class of university humanists and scholars who come to the center and do their work. Um, it's from that work, from that scholarship, from that knowledge that uh, we then launch our education projects and programs. And our intent, I think, is to infuse uh, education and instruction with content, with scholarship, with emerging understandings, but also a process of doing that work. And again, I think uh, I think it's it's unlikely that many of you have Dolly Parton in your state standards or curriculum that you're required to teach. But I think there's a process that we're going to discuss tonight that will be easily applicable to you and your students and your classrooms, wherever you might be. You can also visit the center if you're not in North Carolina through our website. Uh, we spent a lot of time this past year making all the content in our website searchable and a part of a, a larger index. So you can have through keywords not only our education materials, but our scholarly products and materials, as well as our outreach work. So, for example, if tonight's uh, session is intriguing to you and you wanted to go to our site and type in something like music, you might find this podcast, one that we did uh, a year ago with Ben Wides, who's a public school teacher in New York, and Warren Zanes, who is a uh, rock and roll biographer. In fact, Warren wrote the seminal uh, book on Tom Petty. Um, so this is a podcast that is uh, yours to sort of listen to the ways they think about music and the ways that music can help us understand the layers of the culture as we discussed. All these materials are free and accessible, and we encourage you to find ways to use them in your instruction, and ideally to let us know how you're doing that. Which brings me actually to how I even uh, came to tonight's session. Um, you know, one of the things that I do as I plan each year's uh, webinar slate of webinar speakers is I, I try to imagine different topics that are both curricular and things that we need in our curriculum, but also things that are extracurricular, things that are interesting and appealing and intriguing, and perhaps even things that you can take to your students and sort of hook them through these, these alternative lenses. Um, in many cases, these are past fellows uh, or they're scholars that I've worked with or know about or been recommended. And in some cases, I just have an idea and I try to find it. So about a year ago this time, I went to this website, Bunk. Uh, Bunk History is one of our co-sponsors tonight. And 
Um, I use Bunk often to find topics or stories or articles from the scholarly world that uh, can be pulled together with this with it with an algorithm that allows me to see the connection between them and i don't remember what i searched for but when i typed bunk in i said something like southern women or southern music or something because i was uh aiming to create regional sessions this year which i think we've been able to do I have a a webinar that focuses on different regions of the country but sure enough i typed that in and i got uh this search result and that includes an article by uh, by jesse that is the basis of tonight's webinar. I'm really pleased that um, that New American History and Bunk is a partner with us tonight. As a matter of fact, I invited Annie Evans and Ed Ayers to be our co-brand, our co-sponsor, primarily because I used their tool to, to find and locate Jesse in the first place. Uh, Annie Evans is with us tonight. She's the Director of Education and Outreach at New American History, which is based at the University of Richmond in Virginia. Uh, Annie, I've opened up your mic, are you there? I am. Good evening, folks. Tell us a little bit about New American History and Bunk, please. Well, first of all, we would like to thank you for inviting us to co-sponsor this evening. We launched our website about a week and a half ago, and um, we've been really pleased with the feedback we've had so far. I hope those of you who already are subscribing to Bunk or um, had already found newamericanhistory.org through various social media channels or word of mouth, um, We'd love to hear your feedback. If this is your first time hearing about it tonight, that's terrific, and we appreciate that, Andy. Um, I hope maybe you'll give us a look at this week and, and let us know what you think. Um, we're always looking for suggestions for new topics, both for Bunk and also for New American History. Um, this is kind of the brainchild of Ed Ayers, and it's taking a lot of different projects that he's worked on over the years. Um, American Panorama is our digital atlas. So in addition to that and Bunk, we also have the Backstory podcast, um, which Ed's been involved with for a number of years, and a new PBS series called Future of America's Past. So what uh, Ed envisions with New American History is that we're going to harness all these terrific tools and then break them down for K-12 teachers like ourselves. And that's where learnnewamericanhistory.org comes in. And we hope that perhaps you'll take a look and subscribe to both our newsletters. My role will be to push out um, information about new le learning resources as they're added to the site. And the first uh, URL you see up there will subscribe you to Ed's uh, medium blog posts and occasional musings on history. So I hope you'll enjoy both. And thanks again, Andy. Thank you, Annie. And uh, again, I can't speak uh, more highly of uh, the materials that you'll find in the site or the ways that it connects you with um, what can sometimes be an overwhelming amount of content on the internet. Um, and it's always good to have a scholarly lens that's uh, connecting and building that bridge to the classroom. So thanks again, Annie. And uh, please do sign up to receive the new American uh, newsletters, to follow them on social media and to uh, be a part of their network. A couple other quick announcements I'd like to make before we get started. Um, we've had to reschedule a couple of sessions. That includes the session with Johnny Smith on Jackie Robinson and civil rights history, originally scheduled in December. That's now uh, slated for April 28th. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we had to reschedule last week's session with Leif Bovins. Uh, he'll be working with us on teaching ethics through short stories, and that's now been um, rescheduled for March the 10th. There are still 17 seats left for understanding the modern Middle East with past fellow Akram Qatar. He's in North Carolina State and uh, does a lot of great work in helping us understand the complexities of that region. Uh, when I signed on tonight, I double checked and there's 17 seats. Please go and sign up if you're interested. And at the end of this semester, uh, if you have attended all of the sessions you've signed up for, you will receive a special bonus track link to join Carolyn Denard and uh, discuss the life and writings of Toni Morrison. A couple other quick announcements. We are still uh, accepting applications for our 10-day summer institute titled Contested Territory, America's Role in Southeast Asia, 1945 to 1975. We're limiting uh, the space to 36 educators. Um, applications are due March the 1st, and those selected will be receiving a $2,100 stipend to come to the uh, Triangle area, move to North Carolina for two weeks, and join us at the center on a daily basis to work with scholars in, in many different um, humanities disciplines on how to understand this, this complex landscape and then better position the American Civil War. 
We also have uh, current registration open for our online courses. That includes a session titled From the 60s to Now, in which we use rock and roll music to better understand the second half of the 20th century in terms of social movements and gender and sexuality and politics. Um, each of these courses is limited to 40 uh, participants. And we'd love to have you sign up. They do come with 35 uh, PD hours. So uh, if you attend our webinars and collect those hours and it makes sense in your teacher portfolio, one of these courses is equal to five of those webinars. So I'd encourage you to take a look at them. And then lastly, registration today has opened for a five-day summer institute We'll be working with artist in resident A.D. Carson, who is the professor of hip hop in the Department of Music at the University of Virginia. A.D.'s new record is coming out this spring and we'll be spending five days uh, working with him and other scholars and artists and musicians and hip hop artists to understand the African-American experience. So often we're sort of bound by the month of January and our, our goal here is to get out of those 28 days and really find ways that hip hop can become that that hook to allow students to see themselves in the curriculum and explore some really complicated themes through that. We are currently accepting registration um, and we will uh, cap this as well at 36. We'd invite you to come to the center with us uh, for five days in late June. Any of those uh, opportunities are on our website. Uh, go take a look there and you can find the links and the information. Lastly, I wanna thank our Teacher Advisory Council for all, all of their hard work. Uh, that includes Jenny Snotty, who's in the room tonight down in uh, Georgia. It also includes uh, Bonnie Belshi, who I believe is in the room, and Ginger Park, who's uh, out in Colorado. Uh, each year we have a cohort of uh, educators who uh, contribute to our work to give us feedback. They, um, they represent us and advocate for us on their local and statewide levels. We will be opening registration for next year's cohort, cohort in about a month, and we'll be sure you get all that information. We would love to see many of you apply and potentially join us. So tonight's webinar is, as you know, many of you know, a audio only webinar. You're gonna hear my voice, you're gonna hear Professor uh, Wilkerson's voice, uh, but you have a very important voice to, to share as well, and that's in the chat box. So please take advantage of that chat box, uh, communicate with each other, ask questions, make comments, be silly. Um, my job as the moderator is to bring your comments to the conversation, so I'll do my best to do so. And if I miss you for some reason or it scrolls out of sight, don't uh, hesitate to ask it uh, many different times. Wave your hand in the back of the room and we'll get to you. So uh, I could not be more pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Jessica Wilkerson to the room tonight to take a seat on the stage. Uh, Jessie is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Mississippi, and I've included her Twitter handle. I'd encourage you to follow her. Um, I also want to note that we do have a TA with us tonight. Lisa Pennington is a member of our current Teacher Advisory Council and also an associate, I'm sorry, an assistant professor. See, I just uh, I just gave you a, a um, I advanced your career there, Lisa. She's an assistant professor of education at Governor State uh, University in Illinois. And what Lisa's gonna do is be in the chat box. She's gonna share resources and thoughts and questions. Um, she's gonna be uh, interacting with you sort of underneath our conversation. So please do uh, reach out to her, ask questions. Uh, she's received this, this uh, seminar in advance. So she's had some ideas, some time to process ideas. We wanna thank her for bringing her own interests and musical expertise to uh, the program. So Jesse, I've uh, unmuted you. Thank you again for joining us. Um, let's turn your microphone on. Okay, there, there we go. go. Hey, how are you? How are things down in Mississippi? Oh, it's rainy today, but you know, <laughs> things are okay. That's, there you go. I've given you the mouse as well. Um, uh, as we discussed, you'll be able to advance the slides and lead us through this uh, conversation. And you've put together some really fantastic uh, uh, slides in the deck that you shared. We do have some media that we're gonna play, so we'll sort of prep for that. But I'd actually like to start tonight's session, if you don't mind, with just a, a quick personal question. Um, and, and maybe it's my own curiosity about how you arrived at the place where you've arrived. Um, you and I talked beforehand. I know you grew up in East Tennessee. My own family's from that area. Um, did you go see Dolly Parton live? Have you seen her in, in concert? <laughs> That's a good question. Of course I have. <laughs> what was um, it like? It must have been like going to church. Yeah, I, you know, so I 
didn't see her in concert until I was at graduate school, actually at UNC Chapel Hill. So I came over to Durham and, and saw her with one of my best friends. Um, and yeah, it was an amazing experience. She's an incredible performer. And um, if you have never seen her perform, I highly recommend you know, your first chance to do it, um, to be, you know, to go see her. Um, she, how, how she, you know, manages to, to stay um, as active as a performer and her voice is as beautiful as it is, is just incredible. So she's, yes, I highly recommend it. And, and I'm curious, uh, so did you go to Deepak? Is that where she played? Yep, it was at Deepak. Okay, so so you're in this big, nice auditorium. You know, it's uh, it's pretty high end. As you looked around the audience, who else was there with you? I went with my best friend, and uh -huh. we walked but, in late. How yeah. horrible is that? We we had a yeah, hard time cool. finding parking, <laughs> so we walked in late. And Dolly Parton had already she was on her first song, and it was a dark auditorium. And I write in the essay at the end about this a little bit, but she was wearing this pink sparkly gown and the light was on her and she was just kind of shimmering up on stage. And so I didn't really see the audience until um, uh, there was an intermission. And I think as many people know, she has an incredibly diverse uh, fan base. And um, so, you know, I mean, I, I witnessed that um, people yeah. of all different ages, um, races, ethnicities, queer folks, um, you know, people wearing cowboy boots and, and, yeah. and cowboy hats. And so um, really diverse. We can talk about what that what that actually means in the grand scheme of things. Um, but that, you know, that that moment of seeing how uh, diverse her fan base is, is one of the things that I think is a foundation for the essay that I wrote. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm, you know, it's always interesting to me um, when musicians and artists also are performers. It's that combination that really does um, start to cut through those cultural cross sections. Yeah, exactly. So I've given you the mouse. Um, we're anxious to hear what you have to share. Uh, the stage is yours. Thanks. Well, thank you all for um, showing up this evening for the webinar. I'm really excited to share my work and I'm really especially excited to hear your questions. So as Andy said, um, you know, he and Lisa will be in the chat box you know, moderating and um, I'm, I'm excited for them to just interrupt me at any point. And because I, I find with this essay that um, the questions and the discussion that come out of it are probably you know, more interesting than anything else. Um, so I'm, I'm just really curious to hear your experience of it. Um, I wanna thank Andy and Libby Taylor and the rest of the National Humanities Center um, for helping to put this together and for inviting me. And I didn't know that it came out of Bunk History. Um, that's really cool. And I wanna thank Bunk History for um, co-sponsoring this. Um, so, as um, okay, there we go. Um, so this is some of you have, may have seen this already. This is the uh, the image that um, was published with the essay that I wrote. I really loved what the artist did here, um, but I'm going to move forward a little bit. Um, so, and, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about my background. Um, so, as Andy said, I teach at the University of Mississippi. I teach history and Southern studies. We're one of the only places that has a Southern studies program. Um, so I work at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, uh, which is a really interesting place to be. Um, the classes I teach are a range from um, histories of U.S. women and gender history, uh, Southern history, Appalachian history, oral history methods. It's one of my main methodologies. Um, and, and so all of that kind of informed the essay that I wrote. But I do have to say that my, my own scholarship is not about Dolly Parton. <laughs> That's actually more rooted in my background and where I grew up and me kind of taking a scholarly lens to something that was very familiar in my life. Um, so my own work is pictured here, um, To Live Here You Have to Fight is a book I wrote 
It came out last year. And it's about Appalachian women activists in the 1960s and 70s. So um, it's really about the war on poverty and various women activists, mostly in Eastern Kentucky, but throughout the rest of the Appalachian South as well. And how they participated in some of the most significant social movements in the 1960s and 70s in the United States. So that's my scholarly work. Um, in terms of the essay that I wrote, um, I had finished this book that you see here. And I was taking a little bit of a break when, um, and, and part of taking a break for me meant taking a class. So, you know, that's kind of uh, what a professor would do, right, <laughs> is need a break from, from scholarly work. But then you know, I ended up taking a creative nonfiction class. And that class was taught by Kiese Lehman. And if you haven't heard of Kiese Lehman, I highly recommend checking out him and his work and his memoir um, that's called Heavy. It won all kinds of awards last year. So I took a class with him. We're really um, lucky and fortunate to have him here at the University of Mississippi as a professor. And as a faculty member, I'm able to take courses. So I took this course with him and he asked this question, what is home? And I found that a really intriguing question. And on the one hand, it seems really obvious what home is. It's the place where I grew up and I could easily answer that. But of course, he wanted us to think more deeply about how we define home in our own lives. And for me, um, Dolly Parton totally sprung to mind when I was thinking about home and how I defined home. Um, so that was one starting place. Um, and that's where this essay comes from, is that class. And then I wrote this creative nonfiction essay. And of course, that became Living with Dolly Parton. Um, the other uh, influences on this work, um, one was, you know, as I came to it, I was thinking about my scholarship and how I think a lot about race, class, and gender in the South. and um, how those things help us define the South. And I really wanted to think about an intersectional analysis of Dolly Parton. And I have Dolly Parton in quotation marks here. And the reason for that is I'm really writing about the image of Dolly Parton and kind of the brand of Dolly Parton. Um, I'm not writing a biography of her. So I think it's important to make that clear. It's more about um, what she means to other people. And so on that, I am curious to hear from you all. What does Dolly Parton mean to you? Is it about her music? I, I saw somebody in the chat box said um, they'd been to Dollywood lots of times. So I want to just pause here and ask that question. What does Dolly Parton mean to you? Great. And folks in the audience, uh, Dr. Wilkerson is not meaning this as an idle threat, please do, please do chime in. Uh, this is a real question, not hypothetical. Tell us what you think. What is Dolly Parton to you? There's Teresa Lawler, feminist with a nine to five attitude. Boy, do I remember that film. Outspoken woman says, Brittany, thank you. Give you just a few moments to loose, loosen up your fingers. Kevin Clary, she means acceptance, love, connection to his mother. Oh, fashion icon, I like that. Oh, that's great, Krupal. Patrick, that's a great uh, lens to your own your own life. Literacy, says Annie. Girl power, grit, determination, business savvy. Uh, oh, interesting, Jenny. And Always I wonder, Jenny, yeah. go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, um, Jennifer wrote, um, she was always kind of a caricature to us, yeah. Yeah, this is all really, this is all great. Um, and and I think, yeah, I love Dumplin' too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Yeah, so I think what, what you all are getting at is that she's a beloved celebrity. And, and I have felt the same way about her. I think she has become more national and international in over the last decade. 
when I was growing up, I don't think she quite had that, um, that platform yet, but um, I think the children's literacy program has really um, uh, expanded her kind of her presence um, even globally. So thank you all for sharing what she means to you. Um, as you probably gathered from the essay and you know what, what scholars often do is take things that we really, really love and then deconstruct them a little bit or critique them. And, and for me, there was a kind of, um, uh, it, was, it felt a little bit provocative to say, okay, well, I love Dolly Parton and everyone I know loves her, but what would it look like to really deconstruct why I love her and if those reasons actually hold up? And so, um, that's, you know, that's ultimately what I wanted to do is bring my training as a historian, um, especially of the Appalachian South, to this brand and image of Dolly Parton. Um, so what I want to do this evening is walk you through how I did that. Right, so I'm going to um, just kind of give you a little bit of background on some of the concepts that I was thinking about as I wrote the essay, Living with Dolly Parton, and then just think more about her as a cultural icon and that her relationship to the South and to Appalachia. Okay, so I had really four goals um, with the essay that I wrote. And the first one, uh, was to think through the image of Dolly Parton as well as Dollywood, where you know, I grew up going to Dollywood my whole life, and then Dixie Stampede, um, which is uh, maybe less familiar to people. Um, that's why I, I, I had the um, reading by Aisha Harris assigned as well, but um, Dixie Stampede is not far from Dollywood. Uh, so I wanted to think about the historical and cultural context surrounding these things. Uh, so that was my first goal. Second, I wanted to think through ideas of race. Um, I started writing this essay just after Aisha Harris published her essay about Dixie Stampede. So this is happening in the aftermath of Charlottesville and the violence that happened there um, you know, with white nationalists protesting. And, and so I was thinking a lot about that. I was also thinking a lot about the University of Mississippi's campus, where there are many monuments to the Confederacy. There's kind of this Dixie culture surrounding me. So I think about that a lot. I teach about those things a lot. Yet I had never really thought about Dixie Stampede. So I was very critical of what was happening in Mississippi, yet had not thought about this place that was just down the road from where I grew up. Um, and I wanted to think about those things in terms of um, ideas of race, including whiteness. So how do they reproduce, produce and reproduce these ideas? Um, third, I wanted to show how gender, race, and sexuality intertwine um, in these, you know, in, in Parton's brand, in her company, in the theme park that she's created. And then lastly, uh, as a labor historian, a labor and working class historian, I wanted to think about how Parton um, is presenting ideas about working class culture alongside the stories of actual working class people at Dollywood. And my, own, my mom worked in Sevier County where Dollywood is. She knew a lot of people who worked there. I've had cousins who worked at Dollywood. And so, um, that, you know, there was a real tension there for me, like someone embracing working class culture, but then, you know, I was curious, what does it actually look like to work there? So I wanted to bring my training you know, as an Appalachian historian, a labor historian, a gender historian, and then think about this ubiquitous brand of Dolly Parton. Hey, um, if you don't mind me asking just a quick question, and I promise yeah. to keep us on time and, and on track. Um, as you begin to explore these ideas, um, presumably you shared them with your family or with others from that same area. How, what was their response? What was the reaction to that? 
Oh, yes, I shared it. I shared it before I published it because yeah. I was terrified of publishing this. Um, I was, you know, I, I, I don't, is anyone from East Tennessee? Anyone in the, uh, in the webinar? Raise We've got your some hand. folks from Western North Carolina, just down 25. Yeah. Um, yeah, Maybe. I think, you know, being from East Tennessee, it's like you don't question Dolly Parton mm -hmm. and her credentials, and you don't question Pat Summit, coach of the Lady Vols, and her <laughs> credentials, right? I mean, like, those are two things I knew. <laughs> and so it was, um, I did this with a bit of trepidation. Of course, I wrote the essay for a class, and I shared it. I should say, I wrote this in a class of undergraduates at the University of Mississippi, I was, you know, the, a, a professor taking a class um, with undergrads. And so they were a really tough audience. Many of them you know, grew up in Mississippi or in the South and had been to Dollywood. Um, and so I had them as an audience. And then, yes, I sent it to family members. And I just was like, you know, how does this hit you? Am I going too far here? Are you mad at me because I did this? And mostly the response was, no, this was helpful for, for me to think through why Dolly Parton is a celebrity, um, why people love her so much, and you know how she's actually, um, the brand of Dolly Parton can help us think about history. So, but to answer your question, Andy, yes, I was terrified and I needed to share it with people and make sure they were okay with it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, so I just have a few images up here. I see that some people have been to Dixie Stampede in Dollywood. So of course, these are two of the spaces that I was thinking about in writing this essay. And um, along with those, um, for those of you who've read the essay, I was thinking about memoir as well, which was very different for me because I'm a historian who writes about other people. But in the class I was taking I, you know, with a memoirist, um, I was really challenged to think about myself in relation to history and culture. And so um, this is a picture of me as a little girl that my mom took um, at uh, on the land where our house is, where I grew up next door to my grandmother. And, um, you know, it's not far from the Smoky Mountains. You can actually see the Smoky Mountains um, if you're standing on a ridge on our property. And, and so I wanted to think about the kind of myths about Appalachia that I was raised on and how as an Appalachian historian, I really had to confront many of those myths. And I think a lot of, many of my students have to do the same thing about the South, um, where they really identify as Southerners. They really love the South, yet it has a complicated history that we have to think through really intentionally, and some of it may be difficult. So I, I was kind of asking myself to do what I was often challenging my students to do. Um, so, and then of course, there's a picture here of the Smoky Mountains and Pigeon Forge, where Dollywood is. So these are kind of the stories that I was intertwining, um, you know, family history, history of Dollywood, history of Dolly Parton, history of place, you know, East Tennessee as a place um, in this essay. Okay, so I want to um, give a little bit of background on some of the ideas that were informing the essay that I wrote. And so one of those um, ideas has to, or, or not so much an idea, but um, some context is about tourism in the South. Any of you who've been to Pigeon Forge or Dollywood, you know that it is, uh, that the primary industry is tourism. So that tourism has a long history in the South. And um, the book that I would recommend is by um, Karen Cox, who wrote Dreaming of Dixie, which you can see here. And um, in this book, she writes about the late 19th century 
through World War II. So a little bit earlier than what I was writing about, but I think was important for the development of the tourism industry. And she writes in her introduction, regardless of the medium, the image of the American South was consistent. Southern bells and gentlemen, mammies and uncles, white columned mansions, fields of cotton, and literally moonlight and magnolias were employed to suggest Dixie. Southerners were not responsible for marketing and disseminating this imagery for national consumption, but they also wanted in on this scheme. So essentially what Karen Cox argues is that it's really um, advertisers in places like New York and out, outside of the South who create some of these images of the South and market them, but that eventually Southerners themselves decide, as she said, they want in on this scheme. They want a part of this business model. And so, um, we can see that with Dollywood. Of course, one way to read Dolly Parton is that she sees a business model to participate in with the tourism industry. And of course, she's selling ideas about Appalachia, which we'll get into. Um, so just to continue a little bit with Karen Cox, uh, she wrote, Southern state and local governments, as well as individual entrepreneurs, not only understood the region's identity, in the national imagination, but sought to capitalize on it by providing non-Southern tourists, especially those from the North and the Midwest, with exactly what they had come to expect of the South, whether it was being able to see Blacks working in cotton fields, taking tours of old plantations, or experiencing that ubiquitous feature of life in Dixie, known as Southern hospitality. So, you know, I, I would consider all of all of this um, that's a part of the, the development of the tourism industry um, an important way for us to understand what Southern studies scholars call the Southern imaginary. And so what that means is that you know, as a Southern studies scholar, I think about the South, and I would put that in quotation marks, so the South and Appalachia as shifting geographic regions and times. So there's nothing static about them. It's hard to define what they, what the South is precisely, but these sites like tourism sites help us to define the South. And of course they also inform our understanding of what the South or Appalachia is. I mean, they do this through ideas of race, gender, um, region and class. So that's um, some historical context about the tourism industry that I was thinking about as I tackled um, you know, the history of Dollywood. Okay, so um, part of this history, of course, is, as I said, creating ideas and images of the South um, and especially of what uh, not only the south but um, race you know whiteness and um, blackness in um, in america and the south so in popular culture we see these images of black people and white people you know as you can many of you have seen gone with the wind um, and some of these images will be familiar to you and these are um, images that are created in that period that Karen Cox was writing about in the 1890s in, until in kind of mid-century. And many of these images are meant to um, oversimplify or, or make uh, the South appear exotic. Um, so there's always this idea that the South um, kind of captures the pre-modern America. And simultaneously, um, these images help um, create ideas of what we call the lost cause. So the idea that the Civil War was not about slavery, that it was that the South um, was a benevolent space, and um, and and that you know race and slavery really had nothing to do with it. And so um, these are things that help us understand what Dixie Stampede is celebrating. Now, of course, we can talk at some point about um, 
how Dixie Stampede has changed, because um, it certainly Oops, has. Sorry about that. Somehow we popped out. So okay, there we go. Okay, we good. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's go back to this one. Yeah. Um, so, um, so essentially, um, Eudixie Stampede is drawing upon a very long history of um, the South in popular culture, and. Um, another scholar that I was really drawing upon here is uh, Tara McPherson, who wrote this book, Reconstructing Dixie. And she's also thinking about gender and, and white women and their relationships to black women, in particular, in popular culture. And so Tara McPherson um, examines a similar period as Karen Cox, um, but she's really looking at cinema in the 1930s and what she calls the nostalgia industry. So again, these ideas of the South is like this really romanticized place where slavery and the Civil War um, didn't happen the way that we actually know that they did. Um, and so these images of the South, um, uh, as she says, function to obscure the region's history of racial violence, but also cross-racial alliances. So we don't really learn about political struggles in the South. It's a really sanitized version of the South. And I should say that it's always meant to entertain people. And that's exactly um, what Stampede is about, right? It's about entertaining people, romanticizing the South. Um, people are dressed in kind of um, uh, as bells, you know, Southern bells and um, play silly games. And it makes it seem like the South is full of like fun and hospitality and we don't really have to deal with the history. And so those things are informing the way I think about Southern culture and especially Dixie Stampede. And my hunch is that it also informed Aisha Harris's Slate essay. Um, so I want to pause here and just um, ask you all what your reaction was to Aisha Harris's Slate article. And I would say that um, I came to this article around, right before I wrote my own piece. And I read it and it really made me pause and think why I had never really questioned Dixie Stampede myself. I grew up surrounded by billboards advertising Dixie Stampede and Dollywood, and I never really thought about it historically. I never really questioned it. Um, I, and you might even say to me that, that Dolly Parton kind of provided cover for it because it was something Dolly Parton promoted was Dixie Stampede. So um, again, I'll just pause here and say and ask, um, what were your reactions to Aisha Harris's piece? Go ahead and take a drink of water, uh, Jesse, and pause yourself. Let's see what folks think. Love to hear your comments. Again, that chat box is at the bottom of your control panel. You can see uh, people all over the country right now uh, shuffling mm -hmm. through to find that reading. There's Maryland Draft. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. World Fairs reminds Maryland of the historical reenactments like Wild West shows or Teddy Roosevelt and Rough Riders at San Juan Hill, the turn of the century fairs. It's a great point, Marilyn. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, Marilyn's bringing up a great point that history and entertainment are blurred. And in fact, um, some people might feel, I even had a student who, who went to Dollywood, he came back and told me and he said, I understand Appalachian history now, 
because he had experienced Dollywood as a historically accurate space. Mm. And, and I understand why, although the fact is it's not actually based on Appalachian history, you know, in a scholarly sense. Which is what may draw some distinctions between it and museums or historic sites or or other places that make those interpretations. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's Kayla Forrest. Great to see you. Um, let's see what Julie said. It just popped out of view. Thank you, Ellen. That's a great point. Settling says Natalie Abram from Charlotte. Yeah, a lot of really great thoughts there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for that. Yeah, so um, so Aisha's piece, you know, of course, focused on Dixie Stampede, and I have to admit, I had not been to Dixie Stampede. It was not a, it was a place I was aware of. It was advertised, but it's not something that my parents took me to. Although I know many people who've been. Um, but I did go to Dollywood a lot. And, and so I want to shift a little bit to how Dollywood also partic participates in some of that blurring of history and um, uh, entertainment. And we'll skip over that quote. Um, and so I want to give you a little bit of background on Appalachia and popular culture and especially the idea of the hillbilly, which of course Dolly Parton um, often uses this idea of the hillbilly in her own performances. Um, so the hillbilly, um, many of you probably already have a, a sense of what I mean when I say that, but I wanna kind of break down what the hillbilly is. So first it's an image and a cultural and ideological construct similar to how the Southern Bell is a construct, a cultural construct, or we might say the idea of a mammy is a construct. Um, these are not based on real people, although again, it occasionally blurs image and reality. Similar to these ideas about Dixie that were constructed in the early 20th century, the hillbilly was also created by mass media. Um, and then lastly, the hillbilly was a seemingly apolitical site where middle-class white Americans could explore questions of cult culture, race, politics, and whiteness and project anxieties about a changing world. Um, so the hillbilly as a construct is not neutral, but it actually does kind of intellectual work in the world. And um, I've created a, a, a chart here, and if you're interested in these ideas of the hillbilly, I would recommend Anthony Harkin's book, it's a cultural history of the idea of the hillbilly. His book is titled Hillbilly. Um, but uh, I wanted to give you a sense of um, this idea of the hillbilly in relationship to other ideas of say, what, what some people would call a mountaineer or mountain people. Um, the mountain people idea is more positive, whereas the hillbilly is more negative. And so I often give students this chart and, and get them to think about how positive stereotypes can be just as harmful as negative stereotypes, that neither of them really helps us understand history and, and culture. Um, or, you know, if we take them at face value, they gloss over a lot. Um, so, of, of course, the hillbilly is, um, you know, considered backward, um, ignorant, uh, threatened by outsiders, very isolated. And, and those concepts of the hillbilly, I would say, are, are as present today as they were in the past. They've changed over time, but we still see images of so-called hillbillies. Um, Teresa is saying, uh, or asking the deliverance model, absolutely. Uh, if you've seen the movie Deliverance or read the book that it's based on, that is a caricature um, of so-called hillbillies. And so, um, Dolly Parton plays with these ideas of the hillbilly, and I think that that's one reason she's so beloved in the region, is she took this really negative stereotype 
and she made something um, really positive out of it, and she also really counters that stereotype, right? She she kind of pokes holes in it, and that's a really interesting thing that she does. Um, so I want to just give you a, a quick sense of the history of the hillbilly, right? Because just like the idea of the South, there is a history of, of this idea of the hillbilly. So it emerges in the early 1900s. And it's really important that it happens at the same time as um, immigration to the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe. So there was a lot of anxiety about people coming from um, Southern and Eastern Europe and a fear that those people wouldn't assimilate into American culture. So that's one backdrop to the hillbilly. Second, this is a period of Jim Crow and the rise of Jim Crow laws. Um, so um, many white Southerners have anxieties about race mixing and the so-called purity of the white race. So of course, one caricature of hillbillies is that they intermarry and that they also might not um, uh, respect racial boundaries. And so they are a threat to the Anglo-Saxon race. Um, third, this is a period of intense modernization and rapid industrial growth. So there's also a lot of anxiety about that. And the hillbilly is considered a person who holds on to um, the pre-modern past. So in that way, they're kind of respected. They are not bound to kind of capitalist and industrial growth. So they give us a sense of the past. And then lastly, the hillbilly as a, as a trope was one way that especially white middle-class Americans could talk about who was or was not white, who was or was not civilized, who was or was not American. And, um, and so you can see that in some of the cartoons and images that come out at the time. Also some of the writing about Appalachia in this period uh, reveals a lot of anxieties about mountain people and hillbillies and whether or not they're really part of modern American culture. Um, so you can see here a few of the um, a few of the cartoons that were published in the 1930s, The Mountain Boys, and then the other, um, Lil Abner, um, with a, a character there that some I think have suggested Dolly Parton in part modeled modeled herself after. Um, Daisy May, who's part of the Lil Abner series. So what does all of that have to do with Dolly Parton? Um, so I want to think a little bit about Dolly Parton's gender performance. And um, there's this great book, Dolly Parton, Gender and Country Music by Lee Edwards. And um, Edwards has written about how um, Parton, and I'll quote here, has crafted a visual image of what she calls a hillbilly tramp, and she presents that look as a knowingly exaggerated performance of gender. At the same time, she embraces a self-aware fakeness or artificiality in terms of appearance. She insists on her underlying realness or authenticity based on her well-known autobiographical narratives about how she grew up impoverished in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee and made it as a country music superstar in a male-dominated industry. Her gendered persona is a multi-layered mixture of different elements, ranging from the specific gender tropes from country music performance history that she uses in her look to talks about her Appalachian childhood. And, Dolly Parton, of course, is a genius at this gender performance. Edwards goes on to say that Dolly Parton merges this idea of a pure mountain girl with poor white trash. And then in doing that, she offers this critique of stereotypical ideals of white middle-class femininity. And I think this is um, a, 
something about Dolly Parton that many people have come to respect, that she challenges ideas of femininity, but then embraces other forms of femininity. And, and, and uh, you know, she has this great quote where she talks about her look as a blend of Mother Goose, Cinderella, and the local hooker. And um, I really love, I've always loved that quotation. Okay, so, whoops, we're getting to, so, okay, great. Yeah. Yes, so we're getting ready to play a video clip, is that correct? Yes. And I'm, I'm gonna do this on, I'm gonna take uh, over the mouse just for a moment, and okay. I'm gonna great. remind everybody in our audience that when we play this clip, and we won't play the whole thing, that um, if for some reason your volume doesn't work, or if for some reason your streaming is a little bit late, don't worry, we'll make sure that the link is provided. Um, in the recording after tonight's session, we're gonna have to take this out because of copyright issues, so you can still find it on YouTube or other places, but we did want you to have a chance to see this. So in a moment, uh, as soon as you give me the, the go ahead, um, Jesse, I'm gonna play the clip and then you tell me when to stop it. Okay, yes, so I wanted to um, play this clip of Dolly Parton singing Code of Many Colors. This is one of her most famous songs. It's about growing up in the Smoky Mountains and growing up poor and her mother sewing this coat for her from the rags, um, you know, for, you know, essentially from rags. So um, Andy, you can go ahead and play it and then we'll talk about it. Okay, here we go. Back through the years I go wandering once again Back to the seasons of my youth And I recall a box of rags that someone gave us And how my mama put the rags to use There were rags of many colors But every piece was small I didn't have a coat, and it was way down in the fall. Mama sewed the rags together, sewing every piece with love. She made my coat of many colors that I was so proud of. My mama sewed, she told a story from the Bible she had read about a coat of many colors. Is that enough, Jesse? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, so that song was really familiar to me growing up. Um, my grandfather, who had grown up poor in East Tennessee, um, you know, would say that song could have been about my life. And so, um, you know, and the song is really beautiful. I think it showcases what Dolly Parton does so well, the writing autobiographical music. Um, but it is also a performance. So. Um, she is this really successful businesswoman who um, is also drawing upon this working class culture from her childhood. Um, and that blend, you know, of, of uh, Dolly Parton as a poor girl who lifts herself up from her bootstraps and then becomes this famous person and then opens a theme park and becomes a, an important businesswoman. You know, all of that was really intriguing to me and how she continues to kind of stake her career on these stories of her childhood. And, and so I yeah, wanted to share that song and that performance because it's a really powerful one. Um, and it, it kind of helps us to think also though about the working class performance of Dolly Parton. So again, she's taking these ideas of the South, of Appalachia, she's taking these gendered ideas and playing around with them. And then she's also taking ideas of working class culture um, into her performance. Okay, so as many of you know, and I think a few of you mentioned earlier, um, you're familiar with the song Nine to Five and Dolly Parton's performance in that film. And you may know that um, Dolly Parton has been celebrated as a person who fights for 
gender equity and LGBTQ rights, um, but doesn't call herself a feminist. And so I've been really curious about that, why some people want to categorize her as a feminist, even if she says she's not really a feminist. Um, but then again, she's participated in things like the film Nine to Five, which is based on a working women's organization that was definitely a feminist organization. So in part, my essay was asking this question, so you know, what does Dolly Parton actually do to promote gender justice or to promote social equality in general? Um, you know, here I've, I've provided a screenshot of an essay by Sarah Smarsh called Working Class Women Are Too Busy for Gender Theory, But They're Still Feminists. And she argues that many working class women um, do live by kind of feminist beliefs in the sense that um, they're strong women, they're promoting equality, they're promoting gender justice, but they don't accept the term feminist because it's too academic and it's not something that um, they identify with. Um, so I was curious about this also as a scholar of Appalachia. So I should say that I came to this question as someone who actually studies women's activism in the Appalachian South. Um, I write about actual working class women in the 1960s and 70s at the same time that Dolly Parton was getting her start. And what I found in my own research is that there were real life Appalachian feminists in the mountains. They called themselves feminists. They said they were part of the women's movement. And, and so this idea that feminism of the 60s and 70s wasn't for working class women actually isn't just borne out in the evidence that in fact, there were many women who were fighting for things like um, you know, access to living wage jobs. They were fighting for unions. They were um, fighting against um, coal industries that um, were strip mining the land and they were fighting for environmental justice. So all of those things were happening in the 60s, 70s into the present. So you know, I, I really wanted to think through well, why do we talk about um, working class women as though they weren't a part of um, women's movements at the time or even since. And so, um, that's that's one thing that uh, has really struck me in how people talk about Dolly Parton. If any of you have listened to Dolly Parton's America, the podcast, there's a whole episode on whether or not Dolly Parton calls herself a feminist and why she ultimately why she doesn't. And so the answer is no, she does not. Um, so I found that really interesting. And so how does she think of herself? And one thing that I came to understand in my research is that, um, as she says, I think of myself as a woman in business. And so one thing that was really important to me um, in writing the essay was to think about the local economy. So to think about East Tennessee, what the tourist industry has meant there, um, how it replaced an industrial economy, and what it's meant for people who live there. So um, as I show uh, in this slide, I ask this question, does Dolly Parton embody working class feminism, or does she embody a kind of bourgeois corporate feminism in the sense that her feminism is really rooted in the idea of her upward mobility and then her ability to you know, be successful in business, and um, and you know she's become quite wealthy doing that. So, what does that actually mean for women? And there are many women who work at Dollywood or women who work at Dixie Stampede. And so I really came at this as a historian interested in labor, interested in working class people, and. Um, as I found out in, and as you may have read in the essay, people who work at Dollywood make around you know, nine to ten dollars an hour, and it's seasonal labor, meaning 
about nine months a year, and it's usually not full time. So it's not really possible to work there and support a family. Um, I interviewed a person who had worked there and she loved Dolly Parton and she loved Dollywood. Um, but it was, she was also honest about the fact that that work did not lead to economic stability for her. And that to me was kind of shocking because I had grown up hearing that Dolly Parton's really good to the people of her hometown. And in many ways, I think she is, right? As many of you pointed out, she started um, uh, literacy programs. She started many philanthropies. But to me, philanthropy doesn't replace living wage work. And so that's something that I really wanted to explore. And going back to Andy's question earlier um, about uh, how I felt putting this out into the world, that part was probably the hardest to come to terms with her actual role in the economy in working people's lives. So uh, why don't I pause there and see if anyone has questions about labor and kind of working class culture um, and Dolly Parton, because I think this is one area that we talk about less. People often talk about her gender performance and um, and the interesting things that she's done in terms of um, her career, but we don't always talk about her relationship to working people in Appalachia. Thank you, and we'll pause for a moment to see if there are questions. Um, I'm also going to remind you, Jesse, that we have about 20 minutes. Okay, thanks. You could talk about Dolly Parton all night. Any questions? Looks like, uh, here's one from Patrick Burroughs who happens to be outside of Asheville in Western North Carolina. Do you think some of this has to do with her parents' involvement or a lack thereof with labor movements? Hmm. That's a good question. I. As far as I know, her parents were not involved in labor movements. And some of this, I think, has to do with the fact that in East Tennessee, um, when she was growing up, there you know, would not have been as strong of a labor movement as elsewhere in Appalachia. So say in Eastern Kentucky, where the United Mine Workers were very strong, um, that didn't exist so much in East Tennessee. So, and her, her father and her parents were sharecroppers, so there wouldn't really have been an opportunity for them to be in the labor movement per se. Great, thank you. Okay, we better go ahead and move forward. Yeah. Okay, so Andy, this is another video. This yeah, do you want me to play the whole thing or do you want me to just play part of it? This one's pretty brief, so I think we can play okay. the whole thing with this one. Okay, and again, uh, if for some reason your audio doesn't work seamlessly, um, you can find this clip on YouTube. We'll also make sure you see the link. Do you wanna set this up at all? Yes, so this is a brief clip of um, from Kimberly Crenshaw who coined the term intersectionality. And as I started um, the webinar, yeah, I mentioned that I wanted to take an intersectional approach to my study of Dolly Parton. And that means thinking about you know, race, um, gender, sexuality, place, and how all of those things relate to power. Um, so Kimberly Crenshaw is really gonna lay out what it means to do an interse intersectional analysis. Okay, here we go. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood with intersectional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. 
intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory. It's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem. It's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom between teachers and students, between students and other students between students and administrators and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students, regardless of their identity. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit. It is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school, for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. Thanks, Andy. So that, uh, you know, that video, of course, um, is uh, specifically about education, but she does, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw offers a definition of intersectionality there. And what she's saying is that these categories of race, gender, class, citizenship, and uh, ability, other things, are a way to help us understand social inequality. And they are tools for analyzing domains of power. Um, and so um, I see, you know, Teresa is making a, a really important point here, and one that comes up a lot in my conversations about Dolly Parton. Um, and she's pointing out that you know, Dolly Parton's just an individual, um, and she's a positive symbol, um, and that it might be difficult to critique her. And and I think um, it, Teresa, you're right. It is. Um, it can be difficult to do this, but I would urge us to understand also that Dolly Parton, that there's the person Dolly Parton, but there's also the brand that's been created. And Dolly Parton is part of the Dollywood Company. The Dollywood Company is in partnerships with the Hirshen Family Entertainment Corporation, which is a one of the biggest, if not the biggest theme park uh, corporation in the country. And so, um, that's, you know, in, in, that, in the essay, I'm trying to place Dolly Parton in these relationships to people in Appalachia, people in her own community, and then also her relationships to corporations, um, theme park corporations, um, and then the business that she has built in the Dollywood Company, which employs hundreds of people. So um, I, I take your point, Teresa, but I do think, um, you know, we can. And I would say as a scholar, it's really incumbent upon me to think about an icon's relationship to the world and what um, it does for people's understanding of a place. So um, yeah, I have some questions here that came up for me you know, as I was writing and then as I've, as I've continued having conversations with people about East Tennessee and Appalachia and Dolly Parton's role in it. And again, when I say Dolly Parton, I mean the brand and the company. Um, so one of the big questions is what role does race and racial politics play in Dollywood, Dixie Stampede, and Dolly Parton's image of the South and Appalachia? So whereas Dixie Stampede reproduces ideas of the lost cause and of the South is really innocent uh, in the 19th century. I would say Dollywood reproduces ideas about Appalachia as an all white space, really erasing other people who have lived there and also plays on this idea of the hillbilly and sells the idea of hillbillies to uh, you know people across the country and, and the world. Um, of course, Dollywood is not necessarily for people who live there. It's for people who come there to participate in the tourism industry. 
Um, second, how does class function in Parton's narrative about her life? And how does class and labor politics operate in the lives of people who work for her company? Um, many people would say you know, Dolly Parton has done a, a positive good in her community by starting a company and employing people. But as a labor historian and as a person invested in economic justice, my question would be, well, what does it mean to have a job that doesn't pay you enough to support yourself? And, and so that's something that I really wanted to think through, um, that um, because people love her, they're less likely to question why, she, why her company would pay people so little. Um, and so that uh, is something I wanted to explore and that I continue to think about. Third, how does Dollywood and Dixie Stampede help us understand the complex dynamics of place, tourism, and industry in the Appalachian South? As many of you probably know, in the Appalachian South, there's long been um, you know, economic crises and tourism has been one area of growth and it's a it's an area where people feel um, a bit torn because you kind of have to sell ideas of that place that are caricatures but then you can get a job from it and so i wanted to think about that tension that dolly parton participates in and what is the good that it possibly produces but what is also some of the harm And then lastly, how might comparing and contrasting Dixie Stampede and Dollywood help us understand race, gender, and place? Uh, so for me, it was a really interesting challenge to think about Appalachian history and to bring you know, many years of work trying to understand Appalachia, the 20th century South, and America you know, into this big question of what is Dollywood and what is Dolly Parton and what do they do in the world? And, and so that's not an easy thing to answer. And um, I feel like my essay was just one stab at these really big questions. And then lastly, um, I am interested to hear from you all about other you know, ways that we might take gendered icons or just really you know, any kind of icon that um, you might uh, be well known in the world and that uh, people feel, have very strong feelings about and take that icon and deconstruct it and think about what it tells us about history and culture and politics. Um, so I would say that you know, ultimately the essay that I wrote really captures you know, one of the things that I do as a Southern Studies scholar. And, and that is, um, as you can see here, um, helping students understand the interplay of race, class, uh, and place, um, to help students think about you know, the good and bad stereotype, the stereotypes that we have about places, and to show how popular culture is a sensitive barometer of social and cultural attitudes. So um, you know, pop popular culture is really significant for how people perceive themselves, each other, and the world around them. And, and so um, tourism sites are one place where we can really see that play out. And then I'll end actually where I started, and that is the question that I was asked in this creative nonfiction class that I took, right? And that question is, what is home? And so for me, and I think for the other students in that classroom, it was a really powerful question and an interesting exercise to think about the things that defined the place that I call home. And that can be really challenging because we have strong feelings about our home, but I would say it's also a really enthralling exercise. So I will pause here and see what questions or thoughts that you all have about um, this kind of process of deconstructing icons. 
It's really great. Thank you, Jesse. And you know, we're at our 10 minute warning now, and I'd encourage all of our participants to start queuing up the questions. And while they're thinking and typing and formulating, I'd actually like to follow up on your last point, which is, um, you know, as you as you engaged in this project, you're an historian, you're trained, uh, you've been trained and modeled and practiced for many, many, many years on how to approach questions with certain evidentiary argument and certain historical thinking habits of mind. And it's intriguing to me that what unlocked this whole thing was actually taking a creative writing class, which mm. if it wasn't an English department, it was at least another discipline. It was, it sort of freed you from the historian, as you described it, the historian mindset. And even though it was nonfiction, it was first person, you know, it, uh, it's it's memory, it's vignette, it's narrative. Um, t tell me a little bit about sort of the ways that, I, I'm gonna say English, but creative writing helped you be a better historian. Yeah, that's a really great point, Andy. Um, and I am, I tend to be drawn to um, interdisciplinary studies as it is. So I am a trained historian, but I also am that kind of historian who likes to read really widely beyond history. But I had never really done this kind of writing where I did include memoir um, and storytelling um, in quite this way. And I think, um, you know, in some ways it made history a little bit harder, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's one thing to write a narrative with a bunch of facts and then you you make your argument and then you provide the evidence and you take on this very authoritative voice, but you're never actually in the text. And Third this, person. Exactly, so it, it, for this exercise, it's first person and it is also kind of explaining what's going on in my own psyche and why I'm coming to particular questions. And, and so in some ways that made, it put me in a more vulnerable position than I was used to being in. And, and that was probably the biggest challenge for me is to show those vulnerabilities. I think historians also feel vulnerable at points. It's just that you're trained never to show it. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're trained to, to, to scaffold the, the evidence in a way that can insulate you from that. Exactly, um, but what we know is there are many choices that historians are making about how they compile that evidence and then how they create their arguments. And so I kind of wanted to show the behind the scenes a little bit more. I asked that question in part, hoping that many of our participants tonight would and could imagine using a creative writing prompt to sort of unlock certain methodologies and for their students, really students of any age, to ask them to insert themselves into the into the curriculum, into the topic, into the in, in, into the evidence. But I'm gonna pull out of that for a minute because that's a really easy thing for them to see and make connections for. And I'm gonna to return to you and your work as a professional. Did you trust yourself? I mean, this is your home, your place, your people, your family, your memory. How can you trust what you were doing? Mm. Yeah, that's... Um... That's a good question, Andy. Did I trust myself? <laughs> I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to stump you, but but I you know, know and I, know I, and I haven't right. stumped you, of course. Yeah. But but you know, we we work so often uh, trying to suss out the difference between history and memory and place, et cetera. But you've given us a super interesting way to actually do it from reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I will say there have been times. Um, I, you know, I got many responses uh, about this essay. Of course, it, you know, it was living online and my email is online as well. So I was getting lots of responses from people. And there were moments where I thought, you know, why would I take on such a beloved figure? Was that the best approach? Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know, I, I think, yes, it probably was precisely because she, you know, Dolly Parton, the person is so beloved. Um, now, the essay itself, as I said, is less about the person and more about, you know, what that person represents in our lives. Um, but there were moments where I doubted my ability to do that mm. uh, because she is 
you know, as somebody said, I think in the in the chat room earlier, she's the person who's be you know, people believe she could unite the country. And so, what does it mean to kind of interrogate like who that person actually is, or, or you know what they represent, and what what systems of power they engage with, um, for better and worse. So. Yeah, and I'm going to maybe answer my own question and say that it strikes me that in some ways yours is the most, someone like you has the most trustworthy perspective because you do care about it quite a bit. You know, mm. it's not going to be, it's not going to be sort of a one-off kind of salacious title, Dolly Parton's World, and we can all sort of laugh at each other about it, but but it really was, and uh, it strikes me as something that you took very, very earnestly. Well, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, and but I do also have to say that I sometimes even worry about using my position as someone who is from Appalachia as a way to say, well, I have a right to mm. explore these things because as a scholar, that's not actually how I'm trained, you know? Mm. I, as a historian, should be able to examine you know, anything in 20th century U.S. history, which is where my area of training is, and be able to examine it um, you know, fairly and yeah. uh, evaluate the evidence. So, um, I, so for me, that also was, was difficult to say, to actually acknowledge what you're saying, is that because I'm from there, because I have this relationship, in fact, it does give me a platform that maybe other people don't have. And yeah, so that's something I had to think about a lot. I've got one last question for you. Um, please, anybody else chime in? We've got just a few moments left, but my last question for you is, we have to ask, did you ever hear from Dolly Parton about this? <laughs> did she no, ever reach out to you? No, <laughs> no, and, and you know, this piece that I wrote for Long Reads, of course, went through rounds of fact checking. You know, they treated it like a reported essay, which I had never done before. And as part of that, you know, I, I needed to reach out to Dolly Parton for comment. And I was able to get you know, to um, some of the assistants and I would leave a message and they would say, OK, well, send us an email and let us know what you're doing. And, and then they would never respond. And so yeah. my understanding from journalists is that's a kind of soft no. They would never decline to comment. Right. They just didn't. Um, I did speak yeah. to the media director at Dollywood and I haven't heard from them since the piece came out. Yeah, I'll be sure to tweet them tonight. So uh, <laughs> if they respond. Um, you know, I, I do wanna, and I'm trying to tie all this together for our audience too, which is to say that um, finding these kinds of first person and home place based prompts is a way to involve their students in the act of thinking historically or the act of commenting and having commentary on the places they live and the people they live with. And I'm actually going to sort of come with, um, sort of finalize my thoughts with uh, with Annie Evans's comment. Annie, again, is from New American History, our co-host uh, co tonight, co-sponsor tonight. And she and I both uh, have lived in Charlottesville for a long time, although I'm in Chapel Hill now. And and I, it almost occurs to me that she mentions uh, the accounts of Charlottesville and the way that community is responding, uh, pulling this back now to you growing up in East Tennessee. It almost strikes me that as an academic, you can you can hear between the lines in a way because you know the language differently. So maybe that's the advantage. I'm still trying to answer my question: Is it do you have a different platform? And maybe you can. Maybe you have maybe you have insights to things. You can hear what people don't say, so to speak, that others from other places can't. And that's got to be a real superpower in the work that you do. Well, I hope so. Um, I will say that I went to Dollywood with my entire family uh, over the winter break, and right before we left to you know to go to to Dollywood, my sister said, "You can't be the fun police tonight." Or today, <laughs> and, and I think what what she Chill was out, getting Jesse. at, she meant it in a very loving way, is that I do walk through the world constantly right. reading the text and all of yeah. the things around me in a way that probably most people don't, and right. you know I'm okay with that, and it it does. Um, I hope it's a superpower 
um, I'll, I'll I think take, it is. Your, take your word for it, Andy. <laughs> and I suspect that's what many of us uh, strive for our, our students, uh, whether it's in history class or other humanities classes, we give them that lens, that, uh, that decoder ring that lets them make sense of the world that we live in. Um, Jesse, I want to thank you again for joining us tonight and leading us in this conversation. Uh, next time you're in Chapel Hill, please stop by the center. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I want to thank all of our participants tonight for joining us. Uh, please do follow the National Humanities Center on social media and at our website. Uh, we'd love to have you join us for not only future webinars, but other activities, including our summer institutes. Uh, as a reminder, if you go to our website, you can find registration and application directions for both uh, of our two summer institutes uh, that are currently open. I hope to see you at our next webinar. It's scheduled for February the 19th. That's next Wednesday. We're working with past fellow Alka Patel, who is a uh, professor of art history at the University of California in Irvine. And she's gonna be working with us on historical architecture, particularly historical architecture in the Middle East, uh, architecture that's been destroyed and damaged by uh, warfare, by time, and ways that we can, we can find those and insert them into our world history and global studies perspective. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to uh, open up the end of webinar survey. Please take a moment to complete it. Once you do, you'll get a certificate for attendance. Have a great day at school tomorrow, and we'll see you next time with the National Humanities Center and our webinar, uh, Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. <laughs>